All right, guys, thanks for joining us today. So my name is Adam Lineman. I am uh, with the Green Executive Consulting Firm, and we have Jeff Heller here also with the Green Executive. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, dive into a little bit about myself, and then I'll have Jeff uh, do an introduction of, him, of himself as well. Uh, so I am the founder and CEO of my own landscaping business, Lineman Lawn and Landscaping. I've had that company since uh, I was 14. Uh, I've been in business for 29 years uh, this year. I'm the founder and partner at the Green Executive. Uh, also a certified Profit First Professional. Profit First Professionals is a, uh, a firm that is owned by author uh, Profit First Mike Michalowicz. And Profit First Professionals is accountants, bookkeepers, and coaches who are certified in the Profit First methodology that are authorized to teach uh, the profit first methodology to other others out inside the uh, inside the field. So that's a certification process that myself and Jeff um, uh, are certified in, and um, we help other landscape professionals and snow care professionals um, be more profitable, make profit a habit, not just a event in their businesses anymore. Um, also at the Green Executive, um, we are certified QuickBooks Pro Advisors. Uh, LMN software certified consultants and a little fun fact about myself is I am a certified barbecue judge and uh, my main barbecue uh, grill is actually a big green egg uh, so I love to cook so if you follow me at all on LinkedIn Facebook Instagram I'm sure you'll see lots of uh, goodies that I cook up and and like to talk about because I like to eat so that's a little bit about myself Jeff uh, my name is Jeff Heller. I'm uh, based out of Indianapolis, Indiana. I've been in the snow and ice and landscape and commercial maintenance industry since 2005. I have owned my own firm, Innovative Maintenance Solutions, since uh, 2012. Um, I am a consultant with uh, Adam and Sarah at the Green Executive. I joined uh, up with them. This spring, I've known Adam for a couple of years now, and uh, I am also a certified Profit First professional on the uh, snow side of things, which is the expertise that I bring to the Green Executive. I've been a certified snow professional uh, designation through the Snow and Ice Management Association since 2017. And uh, I also sit on the board of directors for the Snow and Ice Management Association and the uh, Snow and Ice Management Association Foundation. So a little bit about me. Snow lover. Yes. Jeff has white hearts, not red hearts or green hearts. He has white hearts. <laughs> white hearts that if it snows, I like when it turns to green. Right. <laughs> Love it. Um, this is a, a picture of my company back several years ago. We, um, we have, have grown larger um, since this picture, and then also uh, since the, the largest uh, growth of our company, which was up to uh, nine or 10 crews at one point in time, uh, we have uh, since decided to uh, scale down and over the last four or five years actually get out of the, the, the mowing maintenance and the thing. So now uh, we strictly do landscaping design build projects, um, lawn care, uh, fertilization, mosquito control uh, services, as well as uh, outdoor lighting. So that's kind of been our focus uh, over the last couple of years. But just wanted to show you a picture of, uh, of our facility. Um, we do run uh, two warehouses on a, a three acre site. Uh, this one in this picture here is um, about 6,000 square feet inside in size with an office and several bay doors. And then what's not shown in this picture is another 5,000 square foot um, building where we uh, keep our, our tractor trailer loads and pallets of fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides. Uh, we also do provide snow removal services. And so we also keep bulk salt on site and things like that. So uh, that's just a little picture of my company. And then uh, this is a, a quick little video I wanted to show about uh, Jeff company. So I'll go ahead and hit play on that and hopefully um, the technology works and you can watch this, this quick, I think it's like a minute and a half video on Jeff. 
manage your commercial facility, you know the importance of snow removal to avoid accidents, injuries, lawsuits. But when hiring snow removal services, you must ask about salt usage. The wrong amount or kinds can cause damage to property. Where will snow be piled? On top of the incline, melting and refreezing equals additional ice removal costs. Scope of work. Want zero tolerance? Prevents any accumulation. Or use a trick. Making. Marking curved with fiberglass stakes. Prevents snow plow damage. Timing. Having walkways cleared prior to ship changes. What makes us different? An initial on-site audit of existing damage. Our private meteorology service contact 24-7. We contact you 24 hours before a storm. We have on-site supervision during the snowstorm. We follow up afterwards. We're certified snow professionals. We're one of only three in Indiana. Innovative Maintenance Solutions, 317-975-0275. IndyIMS.com. So you know, the reason why I like to um, share uh, the pictures of, of my company and the, the, the video of Jeff's company is because both of, of my, my company, my landscaping company and Jeff's companies are both seven figure uh, and sales volume companies. Okay. And what's really interesting is Jeff's model of running a successful landscaping business is totally different than my model. And that's really something that we can... Uh, dig into much more, uh, probably uh, at, a, at a time later um, than this webinar. Um, but Jeff's doing this basically with himself and a whole group of subcontractors. Am I correct in that, Jeff? Yes, I have. Uh, I do have a financial interest in a snow company in central Indiana. But outside of that, uh, anything that I provide in maintenance services, which would include landscaping, is all subcontracted uh, throughout the state of Indiana. My, uh, my niche customers are companies that have a big geographic footprint, but a very small facility staff. So uh, they, they like the one call and can get anything they need. So outside of my snow operations, it's just me in my company. So, you know, that's kind of an interesting way of doing business, right? Um, in, in a sense, Jeff is very much like a general contractor um, and has subcontractors working for him. So, so he really has no employees in a sense, whereas on my end of things, uh, also doing seven figures in revenue, um, you know, have anywhere from uh, 15 to 20 employees, right? So uh, it's a different business model. But the reason why I share that with you is because I want you to know that um, when we talk profit first um, and, and are certified in, in the the um, the methodology of it is that we we know the system and we are also industry professionals that practice profit first in our own companies. We're not uh, just someone here talking to you and letting and, and telling you what you should do. We actually have boots on the ground and know um, how businesses um, should be ran and do it ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, just wanted to share that. Uh, as we dig into the, to the profit first um, presentation here, we'll be stopping somewhat shortly for some Q and A, and then we'll wrap up the presentation and then we'll leave it open at the very end for, for final uh, Q and A. But um, one of the stats, and this number has changed both up and down over the years. It, it fluctuates year to year whenever they do this. But in general, around 80% uh, of small business owners are living paycheck to paycheck. And that's quite frankly, pretty scary, right? And that is really why most businesses fail because they don't know and they don't have the proper cash flow in order to um, keep their business afloat. Um, so, you know, with that said, oftentimes contractors say these things and some of these things here that uh we'll talk about is um have you ever said you don't have any money to pay your taxes right 
Um, Profit First solves that with uh, recommending that you open up a tax account in your business and put up to 15% aside to be able to pay your taxes. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, throughout the presentation. Oftentimes, contractors say that they don't even take a paycheck themselves. They just take whatever's left over. Uh, once again, by allocating a percentage of all sales to be able to pay the owner, Profit First solves that. Um, and the list of these other things, you know, are I want something to show for all my hard work. I don't have any money to hire help. Um, you can reverse engineer your sales and divvy it out to be able to see if you can afford to hire help to run your business. Um, another great one here, which I love, is my accountant says I'm profitable, but where is all the money? Well, that issue profit first solves, but the reason why why if your landscaping business and if your accountant says, good job, Jeff, your company made a 5% profit this year, congrats. And if Jeff were to say, that's great, where's 5% of all my sales? Oftentimes it's hiding and it's hiding on your balance sheet. And what is not on a profit and loss statement is things such as um, liabilities and loans that you're paying on equipment on and that sits over on your balance sheet or maybe it's things such as a mortgage on a facility that you have that sits over in your balance sheet so if your accountant does say you're profitable you don't actually have that cash in the bank to where you can go pull out tomorrow it's because you probably have a lot of debt and loans and that sits in the balance sheet and profit first helps solve that problem helps identify where that is and helps also with um, really doing like a pay down, a, a debt eradication uh, methodology with the profit first uh, system as well. So let's redefine profits. Profit is not what's left over after paying everyone else. All right. It should not be thought of as the scraps. Profits belongs to the shareholders and it should not be used to finance the operations. And with making profit a habit in your business, not just an event, by, use, by utilizing the profit first methodology and putting profit first, we are able to secure that money in your profit account to guarantee profitability in your business. So let's move on with an axiom. Anybody know what an axiom is? Tyler, have you heard of that term axiom or have you read the book Profit First by any chance? Um, I have the book Profit First. I got it from Mike himself. But awesome. uh, yeah, and I've, I've heard of axiom to know what it is, basically a statement. Yep. So it's a statement or proposition which is regarded as being established, accepted, or self-evidently true. So an example might be supply equals demand. The sun rises in the east, our two parallel lines never intersect each other. It's a natural belief of something because it has always been taught that way. We as a, as a, as a country, we're addicted to axioms. And what we found out is, is, is we always thought, you know, that the world was flat, right? The world's flat, the world's flat. Christopher Columbus said the world's flat. Well, we found out it's not. Um, we also know that in order to determine what profit is, it doesn't have to be sales minus expenses equals profit. Profit first flips that formula, and we know now that it can actually equalize as sales minus profit equals your expenses equals expenses. So, with a lesson from really 30 million businesses in this country is that we have learned that we can flip that formula and we have learned that um, really that we can put profit first and, and profit really shouldn't be a dirty word. It really should be a priority in our businesses. So as we continue on through um, the slides, we wanna talk about behavior. So here's a, les here's a lesson uh, with a tube of toothpaste. And this is how it kind of goes. So if you ever had a tube of toothpaste, and you're, you're using it for a few weeks and then eventually uh, for a month and a couple months, that tube of toothpaste starts to get low. Well, what we do with Profit First is we implement something called Parkinson's Law. And really what we do is we help 
clients that are implementing profit first try to get more out of what they already have. So an example as relating back to the tube of toothpaste would be, how can you get more toothpaste out of that tube if it's almost empty? Well, they, they, they teach us in profit first that people can actually do some pretty unique things. They can cut off the corner of the tube of toothpaste and try to squeeze more out. Maybe they, you take that tube of toothpaste and you stuff it in a door jam and you slam it on the door and try to get more out. But you become innovative whenever you implement profit first. And so in a sense, that's what we do with our coaching and implementation of profit first is we look at a business's sales and expenses and particularly the expenses, we look at being more ways of innovative on how can we reduce those expenses to ensure profitability in your company. To make more profit, there's three things that you can do. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later as well, but it's either increase your sales and, and basically leave your expenses where they're at. So you'll make more profit that way. You can increase your margins or you can reduce your expenses. That's the really only way to increase your profitability inside your business. So it's really all about being more innovative. So with profit first implementation, what we do is, is we guide our, our clients and, and basically providing more financial clarity inside their businesses by setting up five core accounts. Uh, and those accounts are bank accounts. So kind of think about it as um, maybe back in the day, maybe uh, your parents or your grandparents uh, use envelopes, right? Think of the envelopes as bank accounts. Um, as an example, maybe uh, your mom or your dad uh, worked a full-time job and they had a paycheck. And let's just say for round numbers, they they brought home a thousand bucks uh, in a paycheck period. Um, what they might do is they might cash that check, get the thousand dollars cash, bring the cash home, and they might divvy it up into different envelopes for different things. Maybe they have five envelopes. Maybe it's a, um, a grocery envelope. Maybe they put 20% of the $1,000 into the, for the groceries. Uh, maybe they have an envelope for entertainment. Maybe once again, they put 20% into an envelope for entertainment. Uh, maybe an envelope is 40% for their mortgage uh, and so on. So they're divvying up their money and that provides more clarity. Profit first is really bank balance accounting. And what we do is we have... Uh, the clients open up the five core bank accounts and those core bank accounts are your income account, your profit account, your owner's pay account, your tax account, and your operating expense account. And through the behavior of allocating money on a weekly basis, you're able to move your income that comes in from your clientele into these different accounts and, um, uh, look at your spend and make better business decisions that way. Does that make sense? We talk about that with making profit first. So as we said, our formula is sales minus profit equals expenses. We focus on what comes first, all right? It kind of relates back to Parkinson's Law, how such a powerful ally and how we try to be more innovative. And the proof is in the 401k. The 401k has traditionally been the most successful retirement plan for, for the average worker in the United States because the money comes out first before they have their net take-home paycheck. So kind of relate that and think about that back into taking out profit and then having your expenses left over, kind of like the 401k. So there's four steps to it, as I mentioned, small plates or small envelopes or small bank accounts. Um, another uh, thing to be thinking about too is, is that um, we've been accustomed to becoming a, a society of becoming obese Americans. And so versus just having one bank account and paying everything out of that, which, is, which might be what you're doing now, we recommend having smaller plates and smaller bank accounts and divvying that money out because traditionally that leaves you to being healthier and, and not an obese American like a lot of us are, including myself, <laughs> right? You're not eating at the buffet at one table, you're eating on a smaller plate. So as I mentioned, the, the setup of the core accounts is gonna be uh, your income account, 
your profit, your owner's pay, your tax, and your OPEX. So with that said, I'll show you those accounts and I'll show you some percentages here. And I wanna kind of let you take a look at these and, and, and pause for a minute and ask any questions that you may have um, now based off of, of these accounts and percentages. So I'll go ahead and, and, and take a brief pause. If you would like to unmute yourself and ask any questions based off of this chart, uh, feel free to do so. Eric, welcome. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Do you have any questions so far? No, sir. Thank you. Tyler, any any questions on the chart? No, I've seen it before. It makes pretty good sense. Okay. Some of the questions that we get asked, um, and I'll just kind of point out two or so, is operating expenses. Number one, like so. So these are columns based off of a company's real revenue. So if you're in column A, uh, your business is going to be doing up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars in revenue, and these are your these are the recommended percentages based off of the profit first meth methodology. I'm not saying that these percentages are what your landscaping company has to have, but these would be targeted percentages that would be good to shoot towards, right? Um, I can tell you from um, being a profit first consultant for the last uh, three and a half years or so that the tax percentage of 15% put away is probably a little bit too high. We've uh, worked with dozens of, of contractors implementing profit first, and we are on average seeing seven to 10% being sufficient uh, out of their for, for their tax account. So just a heads up there. Um, with that being said, let's just say it's 10% on the high side, that 5% could be allocated somewhere else in the chart. Ultimately, these numbers have to equal up to 100 though in each column. Um, so just FYI, seven to 10% is, uh, seems to be sufficient. Um, other questions I get asked is, is Adam, you know, on operating expense, well, why is it 30% here? But if you're a 500 to a million dollar company or a million to $5 million company, why is it 65%? Well, that is because typically companies, as they grow, they have different overhead cycles. Um, so if you're a half million to a million dollar company, um, your operating expenses are at 50% versus a company at 250,000 or less at 30% is because you probably will have uh, more administrative uh, people on your team at that point in time. Maybe you have a salesperson, maybe um, there's more overhead in general in your company. Maybe there's someone that you have hired as an office uh, coordinator or someone answering the phone. So typically as businesses grow and become much larger, they, they, they have to have more overhead and more administrative ta uh, people to, um, to handle their, their workflow. So that's why those percentages change. Um, other questions I have is why does owner's pay go down as a company grows? Um, owner's pay goes down and, and that is typically because um, let's just say you're a 10 million to $50 million company. Um, you know, you might be, if you are still getting a steady regular paycheck from a, say a $20 million company, it's probably um, such a minute amount. It's not even gonna be a percentage. Um, but most of that person's income is typically from profit sharing, which is going to be coming out of the profit account. So that's why owner's pay has typically goes down because the owner's pay kind of holds steady for most companies as they grow and doesn't become too exorbitant. And they're pulling draws from the profit account as the company grows. So that's the other question I get. All right. Step two, vegetables first, profit first, right? So just think if we could um, eat our vegetables on our plate first and the other food last, how much more healthier would we be? So I kind of like to relate this back to, uh, back to that. Um, same scenario as if we're at the Thanksgiving table on Thanksgiving day and the turkey comes out on a big silver platter, not everybody goes for the turkey and, and eats off the plate. The turkey sliced and it's carved and it's put into, into different plates. Uh, people that are sitting around our, our Thanksgiving dinner table. Same situation with the bank accounts. Always follow the sequence. So the sequence of profit first is to 
take your money and you're going to deposit it into your one income account. And from there, you're going to transfer and alloc or allocate your percentages. You're going to distribute it and then you're going to pay your bills from your operating expense account. A profit first professional uh, such as myself or Jeff uh, can help determine the proper percentages to allocate. So if, if you're a company that's um, just starting with profit first and you haven't um, done this yet, what we do is we uh, take your current financials of your business and we do something called a profit assessment and we take your profit and loss statement, we take your balance sheets, um, we analyze those on a cash basis. I want to stress that. Um, and we basically kind of give you um, a guideline of this is where the health of the business currently is. And we hope you slowly transition to the much healthier state or those taps or target allocation percentages that we showed you back here. So this isn't where, if you're implementing profit first, where you start by any means. This is where we want to ultimately end up after working on your business over a period of several years. Uh, a matter of fact, just to be honest with you, most of our clients contact us because they need help and they're not making profit. So they might only be making 1% if they're lucky, 2% if they're lucky when they contact us. Um, their owner's pay might be 20% if they're lucky. They might not be putting any money away from their taxes and their operating expense might be something crazy like 85 or 90%. That's when we get the phone call, when they're in crisis mode, and then we help them transition to... More, much more closer to these numbers. Step three. So I told you there's five bank accounts and that's true, but there's technically seven. And the other two accounts are your profit and your tax account that are your vault accounts. And if you uh, read the book, Profit First, we recommend setting up two more additional accounts. And they are also, once again, I wanna stress, they are also your profit and your tax account uh, and they are called your vault accounts. And those are put at a different bank. And what you do is when you transfer the money over uh, to your first five core accounts in your profit and your tax, you immediately move it over to the vault account. So it's out of sight, out of mind. Okay. It's, uh, it's kind of no different if I were to put a plate of cookies in front of you and there was three cookies there, you would probably eat two or three cookies. You wouldn't just eat one. So it's out of sight, out of mind. At least I know I don't have that willpower to only eat one. Do you, Jeff? Nope. <laughs> I'd, I'd eat the three and probably ask if there were any more. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So step four, when you do your allocations, you need to be consistent. Profit First teaches to do your allocations twice a month on the 10th and the 25th or whatever day works for you, but to do it consistently on the same day. We recommend starting out doing your allocations weekly. So what does that look like? It looks like this. It looks like maybe you go down to the post office and you grab your mail and you grab your checks and you take your checks and you deposit it into your bank um, and you do that every Wednesday. Profit first, rec or we recommend after you make that initial deposit of all your checks for the week is to then sit down maybe on Thursday and allocate your money out and do it consistently on the same day every week. So it's important to be consistent. <laughs> Tyler says, I'm the same as Jeff. Orioles never leave last at my house. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, a chat that came in. Love it, Tyler. <laughs> All right. Um, so you're doing your, you're doing your allocations, right? And after you do your allocations, um, you want to do it consistently. Quarterly profit distributions, all right? Every quarter, Profit First recommends that you celebrate and you celebrate with the profit. I don't care if you only have 500 bucks in your profit account or if you have $50,000 in your profit account, we want you to celebrate, okay? So whether it's take the family out for ice cream or it's take your best friend out to, uh, to Ruth's Chris for a steak dinner, or you go out and buy yourself something that you've always wanted, if you can take a small portion of that profit and celebrate, do so. Certified Profit First Professional can help you with moving those percentages of, of where your business's health currently is to those taps that we've talked about. And we also are trained and help with accountability and implementing the program. 
Chaz, thanks for joining us. Got a new attendee that jumped on Chaz. So thanks for joining us, Chaz. All right, ways to increase profit. As, as we spoke on uh, a little bit earlier, increase your sales and do what you can to hold your expenses where they're at. So that's how you can increase your profit. Increase your margins or reduce your expenses. Reducing expenses seems to be one of the more harder things that landscape contractors have difficulty with. And we have ways and guidance on, on ways that you can do that. And we'll, we'll talk about that here as, as we go through. I wanna talk a little bit about super profit. And I, I know um, Jeff has something to, to add to this as well, but super profit, what does that mean? To me, super profit means having add-on work that you can sell to a customer while you're already on site doing a job. We really try to push at Lineman Lawn and Landscaping after we're there doing a soft scape install, putting in a patio or whatever it may be, is to do add-ons such as boulder installation. You know, easily get two, three hundred bucks per per granite boulder added throughout the landscaping beds. And the best part about those is those boulders never die, so I don't have to go back and replace them. All right, super profit. Uh, landscape lighting. If you're putting in patios and you're not offering lighting around patios or lighting in patios or, or offering even simple things such as um, bistro lights to hang over patios, you're missing out. That is such easy work to do while you're already on site and so quick to where you could easily make several thousand dollars more. Super profit. Thinking about those things that you can already do while you're there that won't take much time. How many of you might install trees and shrubs at a landscape job and maybe never even fertilize them. I know it sounds crazy, but a lot of people don't. All right, um, add into your into your estimates soil amendments, things like that. That's such great add-on services that your competition probably isn't offering and thinking about to where you can make really good additional income while you're already on site doing the work. Jeff, you wanted to talk on uh, walk crew detail work. Oh, on, on the snow side, I, you know, I, when you go and clear a lot, a lot of the times parking spaces up near a building, especially handicapped spaces, have cars in them. We will use our walk crews um, to just shovel in between the cars. Number one, our customers appreciate the increased thought and safety for their employees and customers. Number two, it's it's a way to add on revenue outside of our scope of work and our contract. Um, another one would be snow hauling. That's typically done outside of a snow contract or scope of work that has been extremely profitable for us on years where we've had heavy snows. Uh, roof clearing, or if you're not certified to do roof clearing, uh, which we aren't, we will provide the service to where when the snow comes off the roof, we will clear it out of wherever it was dropped. So just ways that we look to add on revenue outside of our snow contract that, that really adds to our bottom line. Jeff, I don't know if you had a chance to meet one of our Profit First clients, uh, Ryan and Nicole Quigley from the Gardner up in Peterborough, Canada. Um, but I know, you know, they offer um, snow hauling. And I think it was last year or the year before, they, up in Toronto, they had a tremendous amount of snow and they made bank on hauling snow away, uh, particularly that one year because they had such a large amount of snow. And the great thing about it is not only is it super profit, but it's great work to be doing after the snow and everybody's already rested. You know, they'll clear their parking lots, they'll pile it up wherever they need to pile it up on site a day or two later between storms. It's it's super profitable additional work that is done absolutely. by them. So Ab absolutely. Yeah, I mean it, it, that's a big deal uh, of hauling that away if you're in an area where um, you get large amounts of snow. So think about things like that. Leverage your vendors. 
All right. Um, this is a this is a big one. I I love um, having relation when when you, when you hear leverage your vendors, don't think of it as a negative thing. It's like taking advantage of them. I think of it as building relationships with your vendors. Um, but you know, can you pay by check and get a discount versus credit card? All right. Um, we have a a, a marketing uh, company that works with us, and for the longest time. Um, you know, we would pay by credit card, uh, our, our marketing, um, invoice every month. And we said, Hey, Leslie, you know, if we were to prepay you three months in advance and pay you by check, would you give us a discount? And I was thinking she might come back and say, okay, you know, we'll eliminate, um, you know, three, four, 5%. If you do that, she came back and said 10%. So that was a win-win for us and a win for her because it helped her with cash flow. Um, but ten percent was huge in um, in that situation there. So um, be thinking about how you could uh, work with your vendors on that. Terms? Do you have established credit with your vendors? We oftentimes take advantage of early order programs and get huge discounts on our herbicides and pesticides. Um, we get invited to one of our suppliers' um, trade shows. That's typically either in Nashville or Texas every year in san antonio and we commit to our uh, fertilizers in september for the following season and we get huge discounts um, not to mention uh, a free trip to go and purchase our products at these trade shows with them so look at early order programs i know site one has those uh, heritage landscape supplies has those bwi a lot of these larger companies will have early order programs and not to mention too, cashback bonus spiffs, um, oftentimes things such as um, certain products also, they won't even make you pay for it until like June or July of, of the season. And you can take delivery of the product in January or February. Uh, so leverage your vendors with their programs that they have. Uh, that's That could be huge. How about labor? Are your routes optimized? All right. Let's talk about labor because labor is probably one of the most expensive line items that we have in a profit and loss statement. So are you doing everything you can to optimize your routes? How about crew sizes? Um, I wanna mention something on, on crew sizes. I'm not saying it happens all the time, but we've worked with a lot of companies that have crew sizes of three, four, or even five people on a crew, and it's totally costing them so much more money than what it should. And oftentimes we see, for instance, crews of three going out and doing residential maintenance. And we ask the, 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 the landscape business owner, um, do you ever have somebody out of that, out of that three man crew calling sick. And they're like, yeah, it happens, you know, sometimes on a monthly basis, someone doesn't come into work and the crew goes from three down to two. And we ask them, I said, do they still get the route done in the week? And they're like, yeah. Do they still get it done in, in a reasonable amount of hours? And they're like, yeah. So why do you have the third man on the crew? Right. Um, think about that windshield time and really, really think about how much more productivity does that third, fourth, or fifth person add to your crews. I have no issues with crews of three or four if you're doing large HOA commercial type work where they're there on site for half a day or more. But if you're if, if you're sending you know crews of of three or four out for residentials, I just I prove me wrong because I'd love to see that why that makes sense. All right, so think about crew sizes. Um, getting product delivered to the job site versus having your crews go pick up products. I was guilty of it myself. Um, you know, back in the day when I didn't know about crew sizes and I was dumb, you know, three guys going down to pick up a pallet of sod, sitting in line, waiting for the sod to be cut, waiting for other contractors in front of them. There'd be four, five, six man hours wasted just going and picking up a pallet of sod. All right, have that sod delivered for 75 or 100 bucks. It's a lot more cheaper than it is to pay your guys the five or six man hours that's wasted in that amount of time. Enclosed trailers, the loading and unloading on a daily basis. All right, save the minutes and the dollars will follow. I promise you. Ice machines, have one at your shop or get ice delivered to your shop 
if you can't afford an ice machine, get yourself a deep freezer and have the ice delivered. Um, same situation there. A crew I was working with uh, many years ago was allowing a, a crew of three to go to the gas station to get bags of ice five days a week. Uh, when we calculated his uh, additional six minute drive out of the way to the gas station to get ice and before he went to the job site and what he was paying his team, uh, we qu quickly realized that he could afford to buy a $4,000 ice machine in six months um, versus allowing his team to go and get it themselves. Once again, save the time, the dollars will follow. Uh, are routes efficient? Well, what, what does that mean, Jeff? I mean, is that, is that different than uh, route optimized? What's your thoughts on that? Yes, it, it is different. I mean, I, I guess I can best describe it in an example. Um, one of my customers is a, a regional bank, has 30 plus locations here in Indianapolis. They came to us wanting us to uh, pick up their snow and it really wasn't so much a cost thing for them. It was the inefficiency of the pro provider before us. Uh, they were sending in two guys in a plow truck. One guy would get out and shovel the sidewalks, which took, you know, it banks five minutes for most of them. The other guy would plow the lot. They would leave and then maybe... 30 minutes later, maybe three hours later, salt truck with an eight ton spreader would show up and salt the parking lot. And a lot of times there was accumulation of snow there uh, in between the two and they were putting salt down over top of two inches of snow, which was basically just a complete waste of money. We came in and explained to them that we bring one guy, in one truck with a tailgate spreader and he is the only one on your lot and it is all done in one fell swoop uh, and that guy can hit depending on the type of snow event usually five to seven stops in a night and everything's done at one time that guy gets out spends the five minutes mm -hmm. shoveling the sidewalks and putting the ice melt down he plows the parking lot, he salts, they're good to go. Uh, if the event's over then, then that's the only trip we make there. Uh, if it's not over then, then in a certain amount of time, we come back and repeat the process during uh, the duration of the storm. So uh, that's what I mean when I talk about efficiency and route efficiency and having that guy's uh, sites all clustered together to uh, minimize as much as possible windshield time. And I, I'm assuming, and I'm, I think we get into uh, what we'll talk equipment here in a little bit, but I'm, you know, also has a lot to do with having the right equipment on site too, right? Absolutely. Yep. We don't we don't need a salt truck rolling through a bank with an eight ton spreader on the back. <laughs> Understood. Let's talk waste. All right. It's one of my favorite slides here, waste. So as we talk about labor, we all know how expensive labor is. And I bet you your labor or hourly rate is more than $45 an hour. Let's just say it is. So if we can eliminate some loading and unloading time with using box trailers versus uncovered um, trailers, let's just say we can save three hours a week at 36 weeks a year and what's your hourly billable rate let's just say it's 45 dollars. well look at your opportunity cost how much opportunity could you have had and how much more production could you have had if you were to be able to eliminate that um gas station stops we talk about that often you know is there two and a half hours a week with between each crew possibly wasted, look at the opportunity cost that you're leaving behind. Smoking, texting, phone calls, social media. Do you have a policy in place like that or, or, or for that, I should say? Do you have a policy in place for that inside your company to try to cut down on that and eliminate that? Do your crews know how to 
um, eliminate some of that? And what's, what's your rules? Do you hold them accountable? So these are all different ideas of where we oftentimes see waste and some examples of the possible times that could be lost per crew within a company over a 36 week stop or a 36 week season. Once again, at your billable hourly rate, um, it may be much more than 45 an hour. At my landscaping company, I can tell you right now, it's 102 these days. So uh, it's much more um, than, than, than 45, but um, everybody's is different is based off of their company's budget and what they need to charge. Um, but just look at how that all adds up when you add up the weekly. All right, save the minutes and the dollars will follow. Let's talk equipment. We talked about enclosed trailers. Um, Jeff, I'll let you talk on the snow parts. Uh, you know, great example here is just having the right equipment on the right site to maximize your efficiency. Um, say you have a site with, you know, our banks, takes five minutes, 10 minutes to clear the walks. You know, we're not, we're not hauling in a snow raider to uh, clear walks there. But we also have sites that have three or 4,000 square feet of sidewalk. And instead of putting six or seven hand shovelers or three hand shovelers and a couple of uh, guys running snow blowers, that's where we're going to put our snow raider. And at least one of them, maybe two, depending on the square footage. Right. And we'll have, if we have one snow raider, we have one sidewalk operator and uh, puts, puts dollars back in our pocket. I mean, that's three or four other guys that I can utilize elsewhere instead of putting them all on a 3,000 square foot sidewalk site, hand shoveling snow. And, and it, you know, it back with becomes, it's particularly important when you have fixed rate contracts, uh, anything outside of TNM. and um, you know, you're going to maximize your profit by spending the least amount of time on those sites. There you go. Um, Frost Solutions uh, has offers on site cameras. Um, this can kind of tie back to labor and equipment. I learned about Frost Solutions, honestly, just last year, I think it was at the Equip Expo. I think they're a fairly newer company. They offer uh, camera systems that the, you can mount out on your client's uh, sites, probably commercial sites, because you want them on larger sites, probably. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but you can put these cameras um, and they are um, wireless cameras that monitors the current, uh, basically what's going on on site on the property. So the current video is, is being streamed right to a website or your phone so you can see what's going on. So you don't have to have a person there. It monitors ground temperature, it monitors air temperature. It does all that. And um, if you are providing snow services and you have sites that are a distance away to where they're not necessarily the most convenient to get to, and oftentimes those places might be in like little microclimate uh, situations to where maybe there's a heavier volume of snow there or the temperature is different there oftentimes than the area that you normally service. Having uh, technology like this equipment, these on-site cameras can be a great um, solution, both um, for efficiency and then cutting down once again on your labor. <clears throat> Materials. Buying in bulk, huge fan of that if you can. Um, an investment if you have the space to do so, an investment in uh, pouring a concrete pad and putting some concrete bin blocks of whatever that costs these days, three, four, five thousand dollars to to build something like that in order to save 20, 30 bucks, uh, you know, a, a ton on your salt come up from bag salt compared to bulk salt uh, can go a long ways and can be paid off very quickly. Um, liquid versus granulars, Jeff. Um, I, we use a lot of liquids in our market, but uh, we're a relatively low snow market compared to maybe somebody like Tyler. We purchase; uh, it just doesn't make sense for us at this point to spend on uh, what is needed 
for the equipment to make our own. I mean, we had to spend enough money retrofitting the trucks to be able to spray. Um, so we we purchase our liquids and just keep them in storage tanks. And um, same same with the uh, uh, the granules. You know, we buy ahead. You know, same point Adam was making earlier in the call. Uh, we try to buy our salt in the spring. Um, nothing worse than uh, running low on salt when you when you're in the middle of a storm and uh, the price is jacked up and you're not even sure if you can uh, get the materials to your site in time. What do you mean by uh, by Plan B in events of shortages? Any salt have have multiple ways to get equipment or parts or salt. Um, you know, we all we all saw and we were all victims of the supply chain issues during COVID. Um, wasn't particularly fun during the winter time when. Uh, we would have equipment break and weren't able to get parts and that equipment sat in a shop, not making us any money. So we made sure after that, that we had uh, several different providers that we could pull from uh, if we needed uh, to lease a piece of equipment or buy parts or get salt or liquids. So just always have a plan B. Which kind of once again ties back to leveraging your vendors as well, right? Having that relationship with them. Absolutely. Ways to increase cash flow, prepaid discounts or retainer fees. Have those in place. Um, I like the prepaid discounts uh, to where, at least on the lawn care side of things, you're you're getting you're not taking money off the top. Let's say you do, let's say you have a a couple acre property that is a residential yard and they're on a fertilization program. When I say prepaid discount, I don't mean take off three, five, ten percent off the thousand bucks and then charge the customer nine hundred for the year if they pay you now. I'm talking about um, giving them the discount back in the form of a gift certificate towards future services, right? So that would be a way to still get money up front to be able to retain. Um, to offer some sort of a discount, but also use that as a way to sell more work. Not to mention, oftentimes people don't even end up using the gift certificates in the long run anyways, because I can tell you that there's a lot of expired gift cards that are probably inside um, my wife's purse right now. <laughs> so, um, you know, be thinking about that though. Um, you can still offer something and not have to give money, money, 100% money back right away. Um, you have uh, you have mentioned here, Jeff, maximizing the use of seasonal or fixed cost contracts. You want to expand on that? You know, in a we're typically a low snow market. It has been ten years here in Indianapolis since we <laughs> have hit our average uh, snow of twenty five inches. So, in order to protect ourselves revenue wise, um, our rule of thumb used to be is that we would have enough fixed contract or seasonal snow contracts that our overhead was covered for the season. But since we have experienced multiple years in a row of below average snow, we have actually bumped up our percentage of seasonal or fixed contracts to about 40% of our total snow contracts now so that we can still be profitable through the snow season. So I'm, I'm a big believer. It's, it's, it's a little scary if you don't understand seasonal or fixed contracts, fixed cost contracts, but uh, we've spent a lot of time playing around with them and, and building in uh, ceilings and floors so that it's a win-win for our customers. And one of the side benefits to that is we can usually tie in our customers uh, to more years with a seasonal or fixed cost contract. Uh, our minimum uh, that we will uh, tell our customers that we need is three years, where if you're doing everything on T&M or per inch or per push per application, 
you know, they can be gone after a year. So we put in three years minimum, and then we have an automatic rollover to another three. So we put the onus on them to come to us if they want out of our contract. Years ago, when we cut grass um, at our lawn care and landscaping company, we would start our season off and end waste out May 1st, and hopefully we get, we get paid by the end of May. Uh, it would be 60 days at the minimum um, of paying employees for their labor until we might get paid um, from the customer. And so we were kind of footing forward the, um, in a sense, you know, letting the customer um, have a credit almost as we were providing services. Uh, when we were still doing lawn care maintenance, uh, we switched uh, for several years and it was so much better by pre-invoicing or, or moving to seasonal. And what we did is we started looking at how many average cuts do we perform in a year? And we were anywhere from around um, 28 to 32 in the St. Louis market. So we decided to go ahead and go with 32. And what we did is we took those 32 um, visits and took that times what our normal stop rate was. Let's just say for round numbers, it was 50 bucks. Um, so we would take the 32 times 50 and we would charge the customer $1,600 seasonal, but we would bill them in over nine equal monthly payments. And so they would get their first bill March 1st, and we would start collecting cash flow and money from them before we even started uh, servicing their property. Um, so try to think of innovative ways to improve cash flow and how to even keep the cost down lower for your customer per month by offering payment plans and seasonal contracts. That was huge for us when we uh, still did lawn care maintenance. And the last thing I wanna, wanna make mention is don't let your AR get out of control. You have to have somebody in your business own accounts receivable and stay on top of it. A lot of companies are, are afraid, they don't like doing it. If you don't like doing it, contract it out. Find someone that's not afraid to make the phone call and to stay on top of customers so you get paid. Ask yourself these three questions before you make any purchase in your business. And the three questions are, is the purchase what I'm about to make good for the company? Is the purchase what I'm about to make good for the client? And the last question I wanna ask yourself is, can the purchase wait? That's the sniff test, all right? If you answer no to one of those, you should probably reconsider making that purchase in your business. I kind of close the, the, the webinar um, and, and once again, we'll leave it open for some Q and A at the very end. But I wanna ask you is where will you be a year from now if you don't solve your profitability problems today? It can be done. It can be done even with partially starting to implement profit first. And that's by simply opening up just one bank account and just start putting 1% of all your income on a weekly basis into that 1% profit account that will guarantee you at least a 1% profitability. As I mentioned, 83% of owners are living paycheck to paycheck. That simply alone can turn you around and can guarantee you to be in a profitable business. Uh, consider joining our Profit First for Landscapers Facebook group. There's over 3,200 members inside the, the Facebook group. Um, Jeff is moderating the Profit First for Snow Pros LinkedIn group. Um, Jeff uh, is, is heavily involved in on LinkedIn. So look into the Profit First for Snow Pros. And if you have any questions or would like to learn more about Profit First implementation, don't hesitate to reach out to myself and or Jeff. Uh, you can simply visit us online at thegreenexecutive.com. I'll go ahead and open it up for any Q&A that you may have. And I'll also open up the chat and take a look at any questions that may have been propped up in there as well. But uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, we're here, um, quite honestly, for reasonably however long you need us. So we're happy to answer any questions. So go ahead and unmute yourself. I will just add if any of you are snow contractors and you belong to the Snow and Ice Management Association, SIMA. Uh, we are a approved vendor through SIMA and we do offer 
uh, to all SIMA members a free coaching session in Profit First. So you can just keep that in mind. If you're not a member of SIMA, you can go to SIMA.org. Uh, I would highly recommend joining. Uh, it is a very worthwhile organization for snow contractors. Jeff, I got one question from uh, from Doug, but before I get to that, though, we we did have uh, Adam uh, jump on. Adam, can you hear us? Thanks for joining us, Adam. Uh, is there any questions that you may have uh, about Profit First that we could answer for you? I, I didn't hear a response from him. Well, looks like we're getting a new message. But anyways, uh, back to the question from Doug, Jeff is, uh, what about extra trucks? He says, we have two extra trucks that we use in, in the winter, but we don't use them much in the green season. What are your thoughts? I, I would try to find some way to implement those trucks into your landscaping. I, I would just try to minimize any downtime of usable equipment that can be out there earning, earning revenue for you. Um, I don't know what type of, of green work that you do. I don't know if maybe you could, you know, turn those into water trucks, maybe if you do flower programs, but I would try to find some way to be able to implement those into your green program. Usually I hear that question in reverse, uh, an excavator or an asphalt contractor. I, I mean, I can give you a, a, an example uh, last week was the SIMA symposium in Hartford, and I was chatting with a guy that owned a well drilling company in New Jersey. And he got into the snow business because where he's at in New Jersey, if they get more than a few inches of snow, the DOT will shut down the highways. And he can't take his drilling equipment out onto the road. So he uh, pivoted into snow during the winter months. So he can put those trucks to use uh, and be out on the road since he is a snow contractor. So I thought that was a pretty ingenious way to get around uh, a government uh, implied uh, rule there. So um, I would look to, I mean, you're, you're free to contact me offline. I'm happy to discuss it more with you, but I would try to find some way to uh, use those trucks during the green season. So they're not, they're not sitting, they're out creating revenue for you. And, and I wanna add in the meantime, until you find uh, something to generate income with those trucks, um, I wanna recommend maybe dropping the insurance down on those to liability only versus full collision if they're not being driven, right? Um, so, so be thinking about ways how you can reduce expenses on that equipment if it truly is just sitting there uh, for months upon time. Uh, you know, other things that I've seen too, Jeff, is um, um, I, I go back to Canada, but um, the, the Quigleys, they did a lot of residential snow back in the day and they, they would use tractors and mm -hmm. the tractors would sit, you know, seven, eight months out of the year whenever they're not doing residential driveways. So they started, um, they worked to deal with the local state up there to where the tractors could be, they basically rented the tractors out to the state to do uh, brush cutting and mowing. Yeah. You know, right. so whatever Absolutely. you can do to be innovative with it, um, you know, do so. Think of ways as the other contractors that you could lease the equips, that you could lease the equipment out to and so on. Absolutely. All right, Adam, I got a question for you. Shoot, Chad. Chaz, go ahead. All right. So there's actually two things um, that you said. Not not so much to do with profit first, but I do profit first, and it's I highly recommend it for anybody considering it. Anyways, um, the mowing, you said you had, you basically had them prepay starting in March. I assume your first mow was probably at the end of March, beginning of April. Is that right? At the earliest, yeah. It was, it was typically yeah. first, first week of April on average. So, like, if somebody canceled, you would usually be ahead and probably have to just refund the difference if you had that come up. 
if somebody canceled like before we started cutting for the season or during the season if they canceled so just like during the season you're probably ahead typically yeah uh we we would and and there would not be any um money that was given back for the most part i mean if, if they canceled july 15th yeah. we already invoiced it for july they would they would typically pay for that then it, it, you know i don't, I don't want to say that it was it was a a hard no but it was we were reasonable with it and and if we had to reverse engineer and go back to, to really see like how many cuts do we really have so far, we might consider doing that too, just so it's fair that way. But the, the, the goal behind it was to get money up front and to make it to where the customers wouldn't have to call in and say, oh, it's July. It doesn't need to be cut this week. Um, you can skip my lawn. We, we, got, we got very little of that when we transitioned to seasonal. So when you did, I would assume you still skip some lawns. Would you just find something else to do or would you just skip? We would just skip them all together. And if there was question, yeah. we would say um, and bring up to the fact, and, and this is this is true, we never charged you when we double cut in the springtime. Uh, that was the point I was yeah. getting ready to make. The, the double cuts in the spring and the fall yeah. during the rainy season. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when you switched that over, did you switch everybody over at the same time or was it just gradual? I switched everybody over at the same time. I raised the prices and I switched everybody over at the same time and I purposely got myself out of mowing. <laughs> <laughs> that that, that was that that was, was that, my plan. Did you have a you lot know, of people that was my plan. We um did you have a lot of resistance on that or was it pretty easy? Um Peggy in the office would say it's a lot. I would say it, it wasn't a lot. Probably realistically when we uh 2022 was our last year cutting grass, so last year. Um and um, we moved to seasonal four years prior to that. So 2018-ish. And when we moved to seasonal, we probably had 15 to 20% cancellation rate that we moved over to seasonal. Okay. Okay. All right. And then the um, another thing that you said that I thought was a pretty cool idea, and that's not something we've been doing, when we do plants offering a fertilizing plant, um, what exactly does that look like? I mean, we even have a lawn program, but I just never really messed with landscape fertilizing or anything like that for the most part i mean is this something that you'd come in and just spread some fertilizer around would you bring a drill out there and kind of core drill some stuff into the ground around yeah, trees? I, I would say contact your, your local you know rep wherever you buy the products from whether it be a site one or whoever that is but i can tell you you know something as simple as uh, we have a product around here called melargonite it's organic yep crap basically sure pelletized Yep. Oh, that is heavily recommended to put around trees and shrubs. When uh, you do that, are you just spreading it on the ground or are you drilling? Uh, we're putting it around the base of, of, the, of the trees and shrubs, or if we're planting, we're putting it inside the hole, yep. you know, okay. with, with some, some bags of compost. Once again, too, uh, that's something I, if you're doing installs, add that compost in. You could easily get a, an extra couple hundred bucks uh, while you're doing an install. Yeah, we, <laughs> we have a lot of clay, so that we just, we already had that included. Like, I don't think they'd want us just to plant without that. Um, but yeah, I thought the uh, follow-up fertilizing program for you know plants like that would be pretty cool. Yeah, pretty easy add on. Definitely, and it's it's something that a fertilizer technician or or really anybody could, could do it pretty easily. And the stuff is is non-burning. You really can't screw it up for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Cool. That's all I had. Uh, any other uh, any other questions before we wrap up? Going once, going twice. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you very much. Certainly appreciate it. Like I said, if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. Check out our, our website, thegreenexecutive.com. You can reach us there or on LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, we're happy to chat more. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time.